fun day. I am going to be live on Ticker TV, which is pretty exciting. This is uh, like an online news network. Runs news and current affairs all the time. I'm not sure if it's 24 hours. Anyway, I am on my way to the studio as we speak. Pretty exciting. And it's a lovely day. And I don't know with, the, with this ultra wide angle lens whether you can see the city in the distant background, but it is there. Alrighty, well, this is where I'm going. This is where I'm going to shoot. Sorry for the sound on camera sound. Ticket TV, there it is. Good morning, welcome to Online Offline. I'm your host, Scott Kilmartin. We have a couple of fabulous guests from coming from different parts of the retail and e-commerce economy. But first, this week in e-commerce and retail. Not miss out and there won't be a lot of product, especially the stuff that everyone wants. Um, come the last weeks in December. Really interesting and challenging times for, for Australian retailers. All right, we move to my first guest who is a photographer, he's a friend of mine, but in a world where everyone's an Instagram photographer, what do you do at the commercial end? Well, Matt Irwin is both photographer and publisher these days. Matt, welcome. Thank you, Scott. How are you? Good to have you in. You are a rare beast in many ways, but one of them is you are my last remaining friend that has never had a job. You are the only person I know that's been self-employed since you started photography in your teens and still to this day, and you and I are neither in our teens anymore. No, no. Give us your background about how you got into photography. Oh, wow. So it's 30 years. It's 30 years this year. It was 30 years in April. And how I got into it was I, I actually wanted to be a filmmaker. So I grew up in the 80s where films like Blade Runner really were a massive influence on my... On my uh, on my photographic eye, on, on my cinematic eye. So I wanted to be a filmmaker and then by the time I got to my sort of late teens, I realised that filmmaking was a, a sport, an industry that you needed to have a team of people. And at age 17, 18, it was difficult to pull together a team of people, whereas photography, which uh, still was using my cinematic eye, was something that you could do completely on your own. It's a solo and sport. That's it. So that's how, that's how it started. It was something basically where the barrier to entry was much lower than filmmaking, where a, a, a camera in filmmaking was $100,000 all those years ago, um, you know, where photography was $2,000. So you get into photography, how do you, how do you start selling your products or selling the, the photos that you're making? And then one of the things I really want to get into is how you've, you've for want of a better term, productized your photography. Sure. So early days, you're taking photos, yep. what, do you, what do you do with them? Um, so pretty quickly, my friends just started to go, wow, this stuff's good. Can I, can I have it? So I gave it away. And then after maybe less than a year, it was like, oh, how do, how, how do I turn this into a job? Because I love it. And I decided that markets was the place to be, St Kilda Market, because I'm a Melbourneian. And the, they only had uh, six months. Every six months, they had an intake back then. And they didn't let me in the first time around. So I went and did a, uh, another... I went to another market for those few months and then, and then I got into St Kilda Market and it really all began and I was basically had a full-time job by the time I was 19. I met you at St Kilda Market. Well, actually, I met your dad who was running one of your stalls. It was uh, reverse uh, child labour exploitation. <laughs> your dad, Les, had retired and he was, he was manning one of your stalls. That's when right. I, when I uh, moved over here from Tasmania many, many moons ago, I looked at markets as a way for my wares as well. So you and I have become friends that way. Yeah. You weren't a regular market trader though. You weren't someone that uh, it was the only thing they did or um, you weren't a woodwork craftsman or you weren't someone that's kind of bringing in kind of cheap stuff, sunnies and hats and things to sell at markets. No. You had, uh, you know, you printed out, I don't think you had calendars yet, but and we'll go into this calendar shortly, but really high quality framing and prints, I guess. Yeah. Original prints hand printed by me in the laundry in the dark room at home. So it, it was it was all everything was done by hand. I used to cut the mount boards, I used to do the framing. So, you know, you start with nothing. How do you turn one dollar into ten and then ten into a thousand and so on? So 
the best way is to do it all yourself. So you've got two Back things then. going on. You're a photographer, but you're also a manufacturer, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't know where my entrepreneurial brain came from, but very early on in life, I, you know, I worked out that, that idea that if you if, to make profit, you've got to make the cost as low as possible. And so uh, manufacturing those sorts of things was the way to go. But when it came to calendars and books and so on, then you'd print them in the thousands in order to get the economies of scale. So actually what helped really kick me off is at one of my market stalls, the buyer from David Jones stationery department said, look, if these, these are great, and I was doing black and whites of Melbourne, there was nothing like that around in, at the end of the 80s, everything was color and garish. He said, we'd love these. So I, I, I saved up five grand and produced 2000 times 16 SKUs, suddenly had 32,000 cards I had to sell, and that's what started the printing game for me. That first order at David Jones, you then started selling into other stores. Absolutely. Tell me how that kind of distribution progressed. So I was around 20 years of age and I would be, I was the most timid person you could imagine walking into a store going, hey, would you like to buy my stuff? And in the end, it was just too terrifying for me back then because I was actually a super shy person, hard to believe. But, uh, and so I, I, I found a distributor and they ended up being my distributor for the next 10 years and then after that basically two two distributors over a decade went to the wall at which point we took it over internally because it was quite hard working with distributors their main interest is just selling what they make the most money out of rather than selling your product in particular and they might have a hundred different brands under their under their portfolio whereas if you are just selling yourself you're going to be doing the very best job the distribution model, we see it with, with huge companies selling into, you know, West Farmers and you know, Bunnings and Kmart's and those But at the smaller level, it was really common for probably 25, 30 years, but just it's, it's completely died out. One, I guess, margins aren't there and retail's really changed. Tell me about online. When did you first get started selling online or what online initial presence did you have? Well, I, I'm, I'm back near sort of the beginnings of the World Wide Web being palatable. Um, and I think, I think I registered my URL in 1998 and madu and became live and me and a mate, we built that site out of uh, HTML and PHP by hand. And that site was so robust and so well made that it was live until about eight years ago. Uh, so yes, I've had an online presence on the World Wide Web for over 20 years. So you built that own site, yep. um, you've got enormous amount of, of products because you've got one photo that can be a postcard, a small print, a medium sized print, a large print. Yeah. Uh, you've yeah. also will go into, but you, but you print on canvas, yep. like archivable painting canvas. So one image can, can literally be 25 SKUs. That's or right. Enormous amount of it. Um, and so the back end of your site was a very complex beast in a world before inventory systems really weren't around yep. to do those things. Inventory system, Who was that part of the site? Did you, was that built as well? So we hand built the, um, the relational database that dealt with two different databases. One was the image database and one was the SKUs database. And we literally built that by hand in code. And I still think it's probably the best solution I ever had, but all the other stuff changed over time, the front end stuff and um, the shopping cart stuff. So you've recently, you've, you've come full circle because yeah. you've recently built your own site. Yes. Uh, you've, you've jumped off the previous, um, you, you had an agency build a big site for you in the mid years. I did. And now you've gone, I need something else. Tell us about your Shopify experience. Yeah, so I, I looked around for probably about a year to find the best, best match for me. And... I looked, at, I looked at so many platforms because it was something I didn't want to, I didn't want to put down 50 grand to have another site. It's just not a good time in the universe right now with everything going on. So. But you had some complex needs because you had a lot of products. That's right. And you had, you really had to talk to some kind yeah. of a warehousing and industry system. Yeah. So I landed on Shopify. It had, it seemed to have the best balance of everything I needed. Like it's not super strong on the gallery side of thing, like showing off all of your works but it's really strong on, on the car side of things. And the fact that I was able to build it myself, and I'm, I'm not a computer programmer, but I'm a little bit savvy in that department. I, I've, I've gotten into the code twice, but yeah, Shopify is fantastic and it does a whole lot of things that my previous site built by the agency just doesn't do. So it's, it's really, I mean, it, the no coding momentum is really growing. And yeah. while Shopify is not a, you know, it's not a fully, no code blocks play it's getting pretty close in that yeah. um all right let's move on to you 
the other unusual thing you do is you've become a publisher and yep. you are a self-publisher. You've got coffee table books. You've just launched this week, the 2021 Melbourne calendar, yep. which I love. Um, going into self-publishing, lots of other people go to a company and try and get a book deal. They only make 2 $3 a book, but yep. they've got a book deal. You yep. went down a different path. Tell me about self-publishing. Yeah, it starts at the start. So when that David Jones buyer came to me back in 1990, I immediately rang up Hallmark and said, okay, how, how do we make... TV interviewers are supposed to flick through the book like they've never seen it. I okay. have this book, but I'm just going to pretend that I'm, I'm flicking through it like I've never seen it. Um, yeah, so I rang up Hallmark and said, what's the deal? How do we get postcards and greeting cards made? And they said, um, you will get 10% of the wholesale value after costs. So I did the maths and worked out I was going to make less than 10 cents a card. And I was like, hold it, this is my... These photographs are my pride and joy. And, and I also asked, what's the expected print run in Australia? 2000. Okay, so you're going to be paying me like $200 for my pride and joy. It was like, nah. I said, that's not good enough. And I, that was the decision that made me go and uh, make that $5,000 and self-publish. So I found the printers and I did it all from there. One of, uh, you and I got to know each other nearly 20 years ago now, uh, a few years into that, uh, I, I said, I really want to come and see this print run. And you've gone, well, if you're going to come and see it, you need to come and do an approval with me. Yep. So one day at four o'clock in the morning, we go out to a printer in Bentley and you are doing, you are, you are literally slide by slide approving pages and pages of a book. Yep. Uh, we were in there, which I, I love a factory. I thought was fantastic. But yep. there's a level of detail that, yep. one, you're known for and two, if you've got a distributor or if you're going through uh, a company to print your books or to print your calendars, you wouldn't have the access even if you wanted to do it. I'm suggesting most people wouldn't want to do it. Sure. Um, so there's, I guess that's one good, but it's also in a you know, huge impact on your time, but yep. you get the quality and stuff you're after. after. Oh, look, it's critical for me. The industry I am, I'm in is about how good the image look. It's literally about getting that yellow right there to be the right yellow and, and, the, and everything correct. So for me, all the effort to get it to the point where you're going to make 5,000 of those things, you may as well get it right. And I've had the old occasion where they're not, and then you, it, it hurts. So to me, the investment in that time is, is you know, not even 1% versus the value of getting it right. The other thing is too, you've, you've, you've found that nice mix from a cost perspective as well of you've manufactured in Australia and you've also had some experience manufacturing in China. I have. Steep learning curve there, but yep. it gave you some volume when you needed, when you needed volume. Yeah, well, when I was going to do the first book, uh, it was clear that if I was going to meet my competitors' price points, I, it wasn't possible to produce in Australia. And this was back in 2012, I did the first book. So uh, that's what ended me up in China. I basically walked around Borders, for if anyone remembers Borders, and looked at all the options, look, looked at the back of the books where they were all printed, found the very best looking photo book, and that's how I found the printer. And the experience was good, but I actually flew to Hong Kong and then was driven into the middle of China somewhere where the factory was. So it was, it was like this five day experience to just do what we call the press check. But it was critical to me to show the printers who were making a lot of these books costing me more than a deposit on a house that I was serious and they needed to do a good job. So that's why I turned up at the factory. All right, we are out of time. We didn't get a chance to talk about you shooting celebrities and politicians and rock video shoots in Flinders Lane and hanging out of helicopters shooting oil rigs. That's okay. Uh, but the how do people find the 2021 calendar? Pretty easy. You go to mattirwin.com. Simple as that, mattirwin.com. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Pleasure. All right. My next guests are at the other end of the journey to Matt. Racing on super yachts and now has started a laundry supply business. My name is Scott Kilmartin. We'll see you more online offline on Ticket TV.